Hey guys, this is Brother Ray Jones with the First Church of God in Princeton, West Virginia. I want to welcome you to our midweek Bible study. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be a part of this time of online learning and growing together. I am thrilled that I get to be a part of your spiritual development. And I'm grateful that you're being a part of mine as well. Tonight, we're going to continue our study in what the Church of God believes. And tonight, we're going to look specifically at the ordinances that the Church of God Reformation Movement recognizes from Scripture and participates in. Now, when we talk about an ordinance, we are talking about something that Jesus instituted by both his, his actions and his direct command. Uh, the three ordinances that we see in Scripture that we're going to talk about tonight are uh, baptism by immersion, holy communion, and foot washing. Now, we refer to these as religious ordinances as opposed to sacraments because we do not see in Scripture where any of these acts have um, atoning value. Okay, what, what atones someone for their sin, from their sins is faith in Jesus Christ and his shed blood. So these ordinances have no uh, sacerdotal or sacramental value. They simply are things that, that Jesus did himself and then told us that we are to do as well. And that will become uh, more and more evident as we look into the scripture. Now, when I say that they don't have atoning value, that doesn't mean they're not important. They're still important and they're still things that we as believers are to follow and do because Jesus taught us in his word that we're to do this. It simply means that uh, none of these works or acts of faith bring about the atoning value uh, or the, the salvation that we're to receive, which can only again come by, uh, great, by faith uh, and trusting Jesus Christ as safe, all right? So when we consider the ordinances, the first one that we'll look at tonight is baptism. Uh, if you look in Matthew, the third chapter, you will see that uh, John the Baptist is preaching a message of repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, that is the message of the gospel. Uh, and it's the good news that comes that Jesus Christ is the one who brings that salvation. But John said, hey, you need to repent of your sins. To repent of sin means we're to have godly sorrow for our sin and a change of action. We're to repent of sin and walk away from sin and walk towards Christ. And those who received this message in Matthew 3 followed the Lord in baptism or uh in uh, verses 5 and 6 says, Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, this ordinance of baptism that we see first with John was not, it did not have atoning value. They confessed their sins and then they followed in baptism. It was the confession that brought about the atoning value, okay? It was not um, the, the water washing over their bodies. Baptism does not wash away our sins. Um, and as Jesus was talking with this group of people, he warned against just looking religious. There were Pharisees there. And in verses seven through 10 of Matthew three, he says, brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. In other words, John was underscoring that before anybody would be baptized, they need to ha have a change of heart. They needed to really be committed to changing their ways. And this baptism would be a public testimony of that. Well, um, John ends up foretelling of the one who is going to do the real baptizing. In Matthew, the third chapter, the 11th verse, John says these words, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandal I'm not worthy to carry. Uh, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Okay? Um, 
John is telling of Jesus, the Messiah, who's going to do the ultimate baptizing. And he's still calling people, though, to come and repent of their sins and to be baptized. Well, while John's out baptizing, one day, guess who shows up to be baptized? Jesus himself, in verses 13 through 15 of Matthew 3, we read these words. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you're coming to me. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for this is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then Jesus allowed him. So Jesus himself was baptized. Now, uh, Jesus didn't have to repent of any sin. Jesus never sinned. He's the only one who's never sinned. Um, Jesus didn't have to have his sins washed away by any water, again, because he never sinned. And John is really kind of arguing with him when Jesus says, hey, I need you to baptize me. John is like, hey, I need you to baptize me, man. What are you, what's going on here? And Jesus' reply is, hey, we need to do this because it fulfills all righteousness. In essence, what he's saying is this is what the Father wants us to do. And in doing this, Jesus is giving us an example of what we're to do. He modeled this for us by being baptized himself. Therefore, he's giving us an example that we ought to do the same. When he was baptized with, uh, in the Jordan, he identified with us. Though he had never sinned, he was identifying with those of us who have sinned. And this was a preview of what was going to happen on the cross. You see, baptism means that we're identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Now, obviously, when Jesus was baptized, he had not died, he had not been buried, and he had not resurrected from the dead yet. But... He did that about three years after he was baptized. And uh, when Paul speaks of baptism to the Romans in Romans 6, verses 4 and 5, he clarifies what the symbolism of baptism represents. He says, Do you not know that as many of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. So Paul is underscoring that baptism is a symbol. Uh, when someone is being baptized, they are saying that they've identified themselves with Jesus Christ who, who literally died and was buried and was raised to new life. That is why we have baptism by immersion. Uh, you're going into the water, you're being buried under the water, and you're being raised up out of the water into new life. That is symbolic, again, of the death, burial, and resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, now, when Jesus was literally baptized, God the Father was pleased with what happened. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, we read these words. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. So uh, when Jesus was baptized, we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all showing up at one time for a historic event. And God himself speaks and says, hey, that's my boy right there, and he's done the right thing. So now Jesus has modeled for us that baptism is important. And then after his resurrection and before he goes up to be with the Father, in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, he gives these instructions. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. When Jesus gave what we understand to be the Great Commission, Part of that commission includes 
uh, baptizing people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In other words, those who have professed faith in Jesus Christ are then to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit to give a public testimony to the world that they have died with Christ, been buried with him, and raised a new life in him. Jesus gave this by a direct command and by his own example. Therefore, we recognize that as an ordinance. Again, it is not a work that saves us by any means, but it is an act of faith or an ordinance that we are to observe and follow as believers. Um, we practice this as often as people come to faith and are ready to be baptized. Uh, I will talk with them and explain to them about what baptism is. And we have a baptistry back here behind me. You see where that light is uh, there behind me. That is where our baptismal pool is. And we baptize people there usually during a Sunday service. Now, I've also baptized people just this year, a little earlier this year. I had a couple who wanted to be baptized in a river. So uh, we went down to the Bluestone River and we baptized them. They had a place, they had a piece of property down there that was family land. And it was very accessible for us to baptize them there. And that was a really cool thing to do. Uh, there are other people who, for health reasons or for whatever reasons, have needed to be baptized maybe in some other places. There was one guy years ago that I baptized in a kid pool. Um, he was very, very ill. We couldn't really necessarily get him to church, uh, but we baptized him in the, the front yard of his house in a kiddie pool. There was a lady in Louisiana. Uh, they had a rather large bathtub. We baptized her there. And uh, her family actually live streamed that one on Facebook. And there's probably over a thousand people that, that watched her baptism. That was definitely a public testimony of the new faith that she had found in Christ. So uh, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and you have not followed him in baptism, I challenge you to do so. It is one of the ordinances that Jesus taught. Well, another ordinance that we see in the scripture is that of communion. Now, communion uh, has its roots in the Old Testament Passover. If you went back and you read in the book of Exodus, the 12th chapter, you would remember how God's people had been held in bondage under Egyptian rule for quite some time. And God ends up sending Moses and Aaron into Egypt to declare to Pharaoh to let God's people go. Well, Pharaoh doesn't listen, and there are a series of plagues, 10 in all, that God brings upon the land. And as each one of those plagues are playing out, um, it looks like Pharaoh is going to finally get a brain and, and obey God, but then he doesn't. But when they get to the 10th plague, Pharaoh's heart is so hard that um, God decides to really get his attention. He's sending the death angel over uh, the entire land. And God gave Moses some instructions to give to his people. And he told them to um, sacrifice a lamb and take some of the blood and put it on the doorpost and over the lintel of their door. Then they were to prepare the lamb in a special way. And they were to eat this specific meal set up in such a way that they had their traveling clothes on. Because that night, the death angel would come over, uh, come into the land and wherever he saw the blood of the lamb on uh, the doorpost and on the lintel of the door, he would pass over that house and the firstborn would be okay. But wherever there was not the blood of the lamb, there would be certain death to the firstborn of, of uh, humans and animals. Well, uh, the people of God did what they were told. And those who didn't that particular night, many centuries ago now, the death angel did come. And it was a horrific night for those who did not have the blood of the lamb over their doorposts and the lentils of the door. And the next day, God did set his people free. Okay, The Egyptians told the Hebrews, get out of here. We don't want anything to do with you or your God. Well, and that was a short-lived thing, but I digress. Um, the, the Hebrews were instructed then every year to celebrate a Passover meal, to celebrate what God had done for them centuries ago so that they would remember and, and be reminded of God's deliverance. 
Well, Jesus is sharing this Passover meal with his disciples. And in Luke, the 22nd chapter, or in Matthew, the 26th chapter, you can read about this. And after he celebrates this meal with them, he then, um, in Matthew 26, verses 26 through 28, we see how God institutes something different. He says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks. And he gave it to them saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remissions of sins. Well, when Jesus is eating this last Passover, the last supper, if you will, with his disciples before he's going to be betrayed and eventually crucified and buried and raised to new life and then ascend to heaven. He, he takes bread and he breaks it and he says, hey, this represents my body that's going to be broken for you. He takes the cup and he says to drink of this. He says, this represents uh, my blood that's going to be shed for you, for your sins and for the sins of the entire world. And he, he goes on to say, as, as often as you do this, you're going to be remembering what I'm about to do for you. Now, the disciples didn't fully understand what was going on in that moment because Jesus had not been taken and tried and crucified and resurrected from the dead. But it all became clear after that. Now, what Jesus was doing in this particular instance is he was reworking the Passover. The Passover meal for the Jews was historically and religiously important. It reminded them of God's deliverance. Well, Jesus was now taking, uh, instituting the ordinance of communion, and he was explaining to his disciples that you think the Hebrews were delivered? Man, there's going to be a real deliverance now. I'm about to shed my blood. My body's about to be broken for the sins of the entire world. And as often as they did that particular ordinance, they were remembering the sacrifice that Christ had made for them. You see, Jesus partook of this himself, and he told his disciples to do this as well. Well, uh, in 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, beginning at verse 23, Paul is addressing the Corinthian church about how they had horribly messed up this whole idea of communion. And in doing so, he reminds them of what the simple um, act of communion is supposed to be. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 26 says this, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So you see, my friends, when we partake of uh, communion, we are remembering the sacrifice that Christ made for us. Again, this is an ordinance. It's not a sacrament. It does not have a toning value. It is a, a simple gesture with profound meaning. It is something that you can do um, in your home with grape juice and crackers. It's something that we do on occasion with other believers as we gather in church. As a matter of fact, on the night that we will be doing this particular lesson in person here at Mahood Avenue, we will partake of communion, okay? Now, there are some people who believe when they come together for church that they ought to partake of communion every time they come together, at least every Sunday. Um, we do not practice that here. We do understand that the scripture says that as often as you do this, you do it in remembrance of me. Um, but nowhere in the scripture does it say specifically how often you should do it. Now, you, we should do it regularly. And uh, when we do it, we do make it meaningful. Uh, and arguably, as a congregation, we can do that. We should do it more often here. And that's kind of on me. I got to work on that to be sure we get that scheduled more regularly. But again, the other side of this is, is too, anywhere you are as a believer, you can simply get the elements of some grape juice and, and a cracker, bread, or whatever, and have a moment with God right there and remember what God did for you.
by sacrificing, uh, by giving his only begotten son. Okay? That is the significance of communion. And again, it is one of the ordinances of the church. Well, there's a third ordinance. And by the way, it's an ordinance because Jesus participated in it and he told us to do it as well. Okay? Well, there's a third ordinance that we recognize, and that is foot washing. Uh, what do you mean, Ray? How is foot washing an ordinance? Well, look in John, the 13th chapter, uh, beginning at verse 1. I'm going to read, bear with me as I read several verses, and I'll explain to you uh, from these verses uh, what foot washing, how foot washing is an ordinance, okay? John chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world and go to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil, having already put it into the heart of Jesus, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel which, with which he was girded. And he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, What I'm doing uh, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered and said, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent, who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. What is Jesus doing in these scriptures? Well, Jesus gets together with his disciples for this Last Supper, and it's a private gathering, and there's no servant on hand to do the menial task of washing everybody's feet as they come into the room. And none of the disciples decided to take that role upon themselves. They were all too busy wondering which one of them was going to be greatest, okay? Well, Jesus, at some point as this meal is concluding, just quietly goes and takes off his robe and gets a basin and a towel and he starts washing everybody's feet. And I could imagine that as all this was going down, they all kind of started to notice. And they're poking each other and saying, look, man, what, look what he's doing. He shouldn't be doing that. You ought to be doing that. They'd be looking back and saying, what do you mean me doing that? You should have done that. Why didn't you do that? Well, Jesus gets to Peter and they have that discourse. And Peter's like, hey, Lord, you can't wash my feet. And, and Jesus at this point just says, listen, if I don't wash you, you don't have any part of me. In other words, if, if you don't let me do this, you're not going to understand what my whole kingdom's all about. Well, Peter then goes the other direction, said, well, just give me a whole bath, okay? And <laughs> Jesus says, no, you're misunderstanding. Just basically the paraphrase here is, sit down, and shut up, and let me wash your feet and get on with what I'm trying to get you to understand. Well, after he had done that for everybody, he basically says, listen, do you really understand what I've done for you? I've washed your feet, and I'm your master and your teacher. If I've done this for you, you need to do this for one another. Well, what does that exactly mean? Well, literally speaking, that was an act of service. It was a servant's act it was common in that culture. And what it meant was, you guys got to serve one another. And here's one way you can do it. Uh, the heart of Jesus' lesson is we are to be servants. And the specific way that he used to demonstrate that 
was by taking on the menial task of a servant of washing uh, his disciples' feet. So uh, he did say, literally, wash one another's feet. Now, you can make the argument that that means, you know, the, the big lesson here is that we're to be servants of one another. And I agree with that. But one of the things that we recognize as well is that he specifically said, wash each other's feet. Now, we're in our culture, that's not really necessarily a big deal. We wear shoes. We're not walking around in sandals like Jesus and his disciples did. But um, from time to time, usually at least once a year, we as uh, we offer at this congregation a time to come together for a foot washing service. And what we'll do is divide the men and the ladies up and they'll have designated areas and we'll get basins of water and towels and we'll literally just kind of reenact some version of this. Now it's not a complete reenactment. We don't have people walking around outside in their sandals, getting their feet all dirty and all that kind of thing. And when we come together for a foot washing service, we're not doing full on pedicures or anything like that. We simply have some basins of water and we pour that water over our brother's feet and then we dry them with a towel. And it, it's a reenactment, just remembering what God, what Jesus did for his disciples. And, and we see that as an ordinance to actually reenact because Jesus literally did it and he literally told his disciples, you got to do this too. And in doing this, you know, what he says in the last part of these verses, um, if you know these things, that's one thing, but blessed are you if you do them. Uh, so we literally, from time to time, offer a time to come together for a foot washing service. Now, again, let me clarify. If, if as a, a believer, all we did was once a year go to a foot washing service and say, all right, that's, uh, that's what it means to be a servant. I'm good for a whole year. Then we've actually missed the point. Okay, I understand that. What Jesus was literally teaching is that we're to serve one another, not just for a foot washing service, but in all kinds of ways. And by the way, there are a bazillion ways that we can go out and serve in this world and serve our brothers and sisters in this world. And we ought to do that. But, um, Again, Jesus used this as a specific example. And to reenact that uh, from time to time is a wonderful reminder that we're to be servants of one another and to go serve others in the name of the Lord. Now, I don't know if you've ever been a part of a foot washing service. If you have not, I would encourage you to, to get involved with the next one available that you find out about. It's a very humbling thing. And it's, there are a lot of misconceptions about it. Uh, it, it. Quite frankly, it sounds a little odd, a little funny. And uh, again, it's really pretty simple. Again, we're not doing full-on pedicures. We're just simply pouring water over one another's feet, drying them, and encouraging one another. And it is a, to, to literally go through that act and remember what Jesus did is a, a great lesson in servanthood. And again, we see it as an ordinance because Jesus literally did it. And he told us to do the same. Okay, so there you have it. Uh, there are three ordinances, uh, religious practices that Jesus told us to practice by uh, his, his example. In other words, he did these three things. And then by his words, he says, okay, I've done these. You need to do them too. So uh, I hope you have found this helpful and a blessing. And... Uh, we look forward to catching up with you uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, we will have a break from this uh, particular series that we're doing. Uh, this lesson is airing uh, in the last part of September of 2024, the first Wednesday in October, which I believe will be the second. We're going to have a special prayer service uh, with uh, our Church of God congregations throughout the state, and that will be what we'll be airing on that particular Wednesday, October the 2nd. And then we'll resume some more study together the following week. Thank you for your time and attention. God bless you and have a great evening.